Hi everyone, thank you for joining me again. This week, as I've thought about our session together, uh, my mind has gone to the word justice, which today you're not going to lack any material when you want to talk about justice. And uh, as I began to study, looking in the word, I landed on Psalm 37. And Psalm 37 has always been kind of a favorite spot of mine anyway. Uh, when God first touched my life was 1980, and I had a I was just beginning a career as a draftsman, and I had this little King James Bible that was maybe three, three and a half by five, and uh, any chance I got, I would read that, and it seemed like I was always in Psalm 37 to 40, always looking at those Psalms. So when I kind of went back to Psalm 37 this week and I started to look, it was just a, it was kind of a warm memory spot. And I knew God was showing me that I needed to just walk through this psalm with you and uh, make some comments and some highlights. So that's what we're going to do this session. We're just going to talk about uh, this whole idea of justice and righteousness as things show up in Psalm 37. And, you know, nowadays, talking about the issue of justice, everybody's throwing this term around, especially social justice. But when you really look at it, it feels more like revenge. It isn't really justice. I mean, we have every law necessary to deal with any injustice in society. The law is on the books. It's already there. We just need to enforce it. When people start talking about social justices, it's almost got this feel of retribution or revenge. It isn't, it isn't really going for justice. And I think those who are really wanting to see a resurgence of justice are talking about righteous judgment. Just uh, someone with honor, integrity, character that is put in a position to make righteous judgments. Then, as that moves down through the people, through society, justice becomes a way of life. And we haven't completely lost it, but sometimes it feels like we're allowing somebody who has a hidden agenda to use the term social justice to lead us down a bad path. So I thought, what, what a great way to get us kind of centered and uh, by looking at God's Word and seeing what it says here. Now, we're just going to walk through some verses. If you've got a Bible, you can follow along. If you don't, if you're driving or working, uh, just follow along as I read through this. Uh, the first couple of verses, Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass, and wither is the green herb. And this word, do not fret, it's kind of interesting. The, the actual translation out of the Hebrew means to glow. So it's almost leaning toward an idea of emotionally uh, stirred up, being emotionally stirred up. Don't get emotionally stirred up because of evildoers. Now, sometimes that's easier said than done. We can observe the evil that's being done, but we need to keep our feet on the ground and think our way through what is actually happening. It doesn't mean that we just ignore it. But when we see evil being done, the, the question then becomes, what is my part in fixing this? What is my part in addressing this? We're not ignoring it, but we don't want what happened to own us and control us. Uh, verses 3 and 4. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Now, the next couple of verses here, the next six or eight, this is really like the filet mignon of Psalm 37. Because now, in this section, he doesn't mention evil or sin at all. Trust in the Lord and do good. When you see evildoers, trust in the Lord and do good. Take care of your business. 
don't lose track. Don't fall into the trap of taking the law into my own hands, again, for revenge, retribution, or an eye for an eye. They did that, so I'm going to do this. This group, that person, they got ripped off. Now, the people that did that to them, we're going to rip them off. That's not the way righteous uh, judgment should work or justice. There needs to be a standard here. And so David brings us back to trust in the Lord. There's no mention of the evildoers. And it really, it's telling you, you need to focus on your first love. Trust in the Lord. Um, and I'm not saying to completely ignore evil people again. We're just saying, when I see evil, I start to ask God, what is my part in this? Not to just get stirred up. Uh, we need to acknowledge the evil ones, then ask God what he wants you to do. Obsession with evil will lead you down a bad road. If you start to become obsessed with evildoers, wanting it to be stopped, uh, and you take God out of that, this is, what, this is what causes the foment inside of us, the emotionally being stirred up, the fretting that he's saying, don't fret because of evildoers. Keep your feet on the ground and let's pull God into the middle of this. Verses 5 and 6. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him. He shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. The justice in your life, he will bring it about. He's going to take, take care of that. How do I access that? Trust in the Lord. I have to trust in him. There comes a point where you surrender your life to him. The direction of it, where it's headed, it's a complete commitment. And that's in verse 5. Commit your way to the Lord. The, the Hebrew word for commit actually means to roll something, like to roll something down a hill. So to commit, when, you, when you've got some heavy object and you're going to roll it down the hill, there comes that moment when you let go. When you let go, you can't bring it back. That's when the commitment happens. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him. He will bring it to pass. You want justice to happen in society. You trust the Lord that he is seeing what's happening. He's going to take care of this. This is what trust is. Trust is when I, there's nothing I can do. I'm going to entrust that to God. And I'm waiting for him to tell me what my part is in this. Verses 7 and 8. Rest in the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Don't fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Cease from anger, forsake wrath. Do not fret, it only causes harm. These are two verses that are just loaded with truth in them. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently. In the light of seeing evildoers, we need to maintain our rest, our peace. We don't want that to be stolen from us. So as I look at this, I'm going to commit my way to the Lord, and I'm going to rest. Okay, Lord, you are on your throne. You are taking care of me. I'm, I'm not going to jump in here and make an emotional decision. I am going to wait patiently for you. Don't fret because of him who prospers. No, it, it, it becomes even more difficult when you see an evil person that's doing an injustice, and they're prospering from it. There's profit that's involved. It, depending on your past hurts and uh, maybe people that you've had run-ins with, this can bring up memories from the past, and it makes it even more emotionally charged. This is why we're trusting in the Lord, we're committing our way to Him, we're resting in Him, waiting patiently while we're seeking Him as to the direction that we're supposed to, to take here. <clears throat> he also says... Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Why? Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. If somebody has done this to you, you've got to entrust that person into God's hands that God will mete out the justice that needs to come to them. When you forgive somebody who's done you wrong, and, and done you wrong badly, forgiveness doesn't mean that they get off scot-free. Forgiveness on your part means that you're going to take them out of the courtroom of your heart and you're going to place them in God's courtroom. You're saying, Lord, I am no longer going to wrestle over what needs to happen to these people. I'm giving them and this situation to you. 
you do what you want with them. And you just release that. And then if 10 minutes later, that feeling comes back to want to get back, you've got to say, again, Lord, I forgive and release them and put them into your hands. It's, this is 70 times 7. This is con constantly forgiving so that you'll be free. Because if you don't forgive and you don't release them, you've created your own prison for you. It's not going to affect them. They're still living in whatever they're living in. You want to be free from this. Maintain your rest. Maintain your peace. And give the whole situation back to the Lord. You know, I... I at this point, when I was reading through the psalm, I started realizing there's a lot of phrases that keep showing up here. So how do you avoid fretting or getting into this emotional state? Verse 3, trust in the Lord. Verse 5, commit your way to the Lord. Verse 7, rest in the Lord. Verse 9, wait on the Lord. Verse 13, the Lord laughs at the wicked. Verse 18, the Lord knows what's happening. Verse 24, the Lord upholds us. Verse 31, the law of God is in our heart. Verse 33, the Lord will not leave us. Verse 34, wait on the Lord and keep his way. Just waiting on the Lord doesn't mean that we just twiddle our thumbs. We're still maintaining, uh, knowing what his word says and working at our obedience. And then lastly, in verses 39 and 40, the Lord is our strength and our deliverer. All the way through there, he is giving us all of the key points to be able to stay away from fretting and maintain our peace so that we can infiltrate the earth, the world, we can fill it with kingdom thinking, and then we can subdue that evil that is wreaking havoc on the kingdom of God. It doesn't mean that we're not doing anything by maintaining our peace, but it does mean that we're going to do it at God's direction. He's going to show us what needs to happen. He will tell us to wait because we don't know what he's doing in the hearts and lives of the evil people. We have no idea. Do you remember the story of Paul? He's in the book of Acts and he's actually killing followers of Jesus. As a Pharisee, he thinks he's doing God a favor. He doesn't know. He's blind. And then he's on the road to Damascus and God shows up. There's an earthquake. He hears a voice and he goes through a complete uh, transformation. Most people <laughs> didn't want to trust the fact that he'd had this encounter with God. They're still nervous because he's the guy that kills Christians. So we don't know what God is doing in the hearts and lives of people. We're responsible for us to follow his lead. <clears throat> All right. Verses 9 through 11. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you'll look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. The meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Instead of fretting, you maintain the abundance of peace. So the key here in this, these two verses is, three verses, those who wait on the Lord, they will inherit the earth. Not those who raise a ruckus. Those who avenge those who did evil against them, we inherit the earth as we wait on God and wait for his direction for us. He's got all these people. He sees what's happening. In fact, verses 12 to 15, the wicked plots against the just and gnash at him with his teeth. The Lord laughs at him, for he sees that his day is coming. So listen to that first phrase again. The wicked plots against the just and God's laughing. Now, we at that point, we need God's perspective. We get caught up in what's being done against us. The Lord is laughing at their efforts. He can stop this in a moment, but he's got a bigger plan that he may be working some things out in your own character, some things that have to go through the heat so that you can wake up to your weaknesses, so that you can see some areas that you need to work on. But don't worry, he hasn't left you. He hasn't abandoned you. He's like a good coach that's just letting you go through a hard time in order to learn something. Verses 16 and 17, a little that a righteous man has, let's start that again. A little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteousness. Listen to this. A little that a righteous man has 
is better. So you watch the evil, the evildoer who's making a profit. Just remember, profit isn't everything. You want to lose your peace over gaining some extra material things or some money or some power or some position? It's a trade-off. I want to maintain my peace. And I can tell you right now, just from personal experience, through the last 13 years, 13 years, 13 years almost to the day that I first went through inner healing for myself, the peace that I now have is producing more health. So I look at other people that are my age who are spending hundreds of dollars per month, medications, doctors, all kinds of treatments. But the peace that I've gained is producing physical health and saving me money. I'm just walking with God and I'm understanding. It's, this is, I always say that my life is like a lab experiment to me. I'm trying, I try out the obedience to see what it produces. And now it's producing so much health in my soul, it's, it's affecting my body. Kenny and I can't believe some days the amount of health that we have. Uh, and it's strictly coming from, it's not coming from diet. It's coming from a, a, a healthy soul. We're prospering in our soul and it's producing health which is uh, John 3, 2, 1 John 3, 2. All right, verses 18 to 20. The Lord knows the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time. In the days of famine they shall be satisfied, but the wicked shall perish. The enemies of the Lord, like the splendor of the meadow, shall vanish. This is the promise that you hang on to. The enemies of the Lord, he's going to take care of them. I believe in the prophetic. I believe that apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers are roaming the earth today. I believe there are those who speak as a prophet, that in some cases God gives them insight into what's coming. I believe these proph prophetic words of the changes that are coming. I'm, I'm leaning wholly into them. I trust God. I don't believe God has abandoned this country and that we're going to be overthrown by a socialist, communist regime. I don't believe that. And this is an encouragement to me. The enemies of the Lord, like the splendor of the meadow, shall vanish. We have a promise from God as the people of God that he's going to take care of the righteous and keep us safe. And so I, I trust in him to do that. And I expect to see it soon in this country. <clears throat> Verses 21 to 22. The wicked borrows and does not repay, but the righteous shows mercy and gives. For those blessed by him shall inherit the earth, but those cursed by him shall be cut off. You know, giving people seem to be more peaceful and joyful. It's just a lifestyle. But evil people are trying to take and to gain more. They don't give life. They take life from those. And this is just another voice for that. Verse 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. That's a familiar verse to many of you. This word ordered means to set up, prepare, provide, or made ready. The steps of a good man, God has set them up. He has put these steps together. And he delights in his way. Though he fall, he should not be utterly cast down. The Lord upholds him with his hand. What this says to me is, don't be afraid to take risks. If you're walking with God, you're a good person. He's got you. If you stumble and fall, he's going to pick you up. He, he can provide for you what is necessary. The, the safety net is yours. Then verse 25. This is interesting because it was written by David. David says, I've been young and now I'm old. So he's written this later in life. Yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken nor his descendants begging bread. He's ever merciful and lends and his descendants are blessed. Why is he saying that? Because he's just talking about the evildoers. Don't fret over the evildoers and the things that they're doing. He is going to take care of you. You're not going to beg bread. He's going to provide for you. You're looking, maybe some of you are really tied up in a knot when you look at all the political stuff that's going on around you. Walk with God. He will take care of you. 
He will not let you go. He will not forsake you. Walk with him. If you're stumbling and, and really struggling, he will take care of you. He will direct your steps. This is his promise to you that you're not going to go hungry. You're going to be cared for. Verse 27, depart from evil and do good and dwell evermore. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his saints. God loves justice for all. This is, we allow the media to get us to focus on one particular area. It's justice for all. Any injustice needs to be taken care of. And as I said before, every law that we need to put in place to handle an injustice, it's on the books now. It's on the books. What we need to be praying for is a revival of hearts that connect with God, honor his word, align themselves with him, and let righteousness come into every home so that good, righteous, just decisions are made by all of us. Verse 30. The mouth of the righteous speaks wisdom. His tongue talks of justice. If you are righteous, the mouth of the righteous speaks wisdom. Don't, don't fall into all of this shooting and accusing and sniping at each other. We don't need to jump on social media and, and tear people apart with our words. You may have an opinion about somebody, but let's lift people up. I can address an issue, but I don't need to be shredding a person. And that's difficult to sort through. But this says the mouth of the righteous speaks wisdom. Let's be wise in the way that we use our mouth. And I, and I would add the way that we use our social media accounts. His tongue talks of justice. The law of his God is in his heart. Your mouth will align with what you're taking in. Take in the word. Be people of the word. If, if ever we needed the people of God to spend more time in the word, it's now. We need the righteousness. We need God's wisdom and insight. We need understanding. We need to grow up. All of us, we just need to grow up and be kingdom people. Verse 32, the wicked watches the righteous and seeks to slay him. The wicked watches the righteous and seeks to slay him. You know what? That's just the way it is. I spent a lot of years as a young man playing football. And when I put on my uniform and went out on a field, the whistle blew, the ball was snapped, and somebody hit me, I didn't stand up and say, hey, what are you doing? No, I'm ready for it. God is letting you be ready for something. The wicked watches the righteous and seeks to slay him. When the, when the wicked take a shot at you, let's not be shocked. This is the way it is. Let's grow up and learn how to take a hit, walk with God, not go into avenging, and just ask him, Lord, what do you want me to do? If it hurt, please forgive this person. I'm going to release them into your courtroom. Now, what would you have me do? What kind of wisdom do you want to give me as to my next move? Or do I just rest in you and wait patiently until you finally speak? Which way, maybe days and weeks or maybe even months until he shows me what I'm to do. I'm not going to lose my peace because I, got, because I took a hit. Because he's telling me the hits are coming. Verse 34, wait on the Lord and keep his way. He shall exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you'll see it. You'll see it. All the time in this country right now, there is corruption everywhere in every walk of life. So often we pray that God will expose the corrupt, corruption. And those who are the corrupt ones, we ask that God would give them an opportunity to repent. God determines that length of time that that is. But if they refuse, if they have a hard heart and they are totally given off to, all over to this, we ask God to remove them in any way that he sees fit. Why? For the sake of the innocent ones who are being abused. We want righteousness uh, to fill the land. We want peace to be restored. And we want the, the roots of corruption and the agents of evil and corruption to be removed, and we put it in God's hands. And in the meantime, we say, Lord, what would you have us do? And whatever he puts in front of us, we do it with our whole heart. 
All right, last couple of verses. Verse 37, 38. Mark the blameless man and observe the upright, for the future of that man is peace, but the transgressor, transgressors shall be destroyed together. The future of the wicked should be cut off. And that's, again, just a promise. God is showing you he's not forgotten. He's paying attention. He's watching what's happening. He's not taking a nap. God's, God knows exactly what's taking place. And he's telling us, rest in him, trust him, and commit our way to him. But this word mark, now this is coming from a New King James Version, the beginning of verse 37. Mark the blameless man. That word mark in the Hebrew means hedge about, guard, protect, attend to. Well, that's interesting. So I don't know why I don't like the translation mark. Maybe attend to the blameless man. Let's help those people who are blameless. Let's come alongside of them. Let's partner with them. Let's, let's get together and say, Lord, what do you want us to do? Where, where do you want this to, to go? We, we, we need to be paying attention to those people who are walking with God. And we need to build relationships with those. And then the last two verses, this sums up the whole thing. But the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. Your salvation is not from what you can pull off. Your salvation is from the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble. Not your ability to avenge, not your ability to pay back. The Lord shall help them and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust him. This is our position. Again, do we just pretend like nothing's happening? No, we can see what's happening, but we don't want to obsess with what's being done that's corrupt. Sometimes, and I'm hearing this more and more from people that take in a lot of videos and a lot of social media that's talking about all these things that are happening. A lot of them are just somebody's opinion. But the more that you take that in and neglect your time alone with God, your spirit is going to dry up and you're going to get bitter and angry. And, and that's when you begin to fret. You're emotionally stirred up and irritated. And, and I always use that as an indicator because in a day like today, we're all going to go through that. When that starts to happen with me, I can usually trace it to I'm not paying attention to my alone time with God or I'm neglecting the word. And that's the time to check your spirit, to come back, reconnect with God, confess. If you need to confess, ask God to fill you with his spirit. You can ask God to fill you with the spirit every day of your life. Ask him to increase the amount of the fruit of the Spirit, just to give you more kindness and gentleness and peace and long-suffering. You want to gain access again to the spiritual benefits of walking with God through darkness. And we're in the middle of it right now. But as children of God, we can do this. We can do this. But we just need to get back to the basics and if you're a little lost and you don't know where to go, I'm telling you this week, spend time in Psalm 37 and drink in these phrases. There's key points all the way through here that's telling you how to gain access to the heart of God and the spirit of God who transfers all the nature of God to, to your life, whatever you need. He is all in there. So Lord, this week we are surrendered to you. We submit our way to you, Lord. And the corruption that surrounds us, whether it's in politi the political arena, in business, in entertainment, whatever it is, Lord, we ask that you would give the wicked an opportunity to repent. But Lord, if they harden their heart, we ask for the sake of the innocent ones that are being abused, that you would remove these, do with them as you see fit, and restore our society by putting righteous leaders in place, Lord. And we ask you that in Jesus' name. Amen.